Good morning. This is Union, Unit 4 <clears throat> in Business Ethics at Newbury College, uh, Fall 2021. Uh, beginning in Chapter 4, we begin to split some of the longer chapters, and this is the first that we're going to split. We'll do about the first half of Chapter 4 in your book. Uh, the topic is the corporate culture, impact, and implications, and we'll just call this Part 1. Uh, there's a cold opening, Creating an Ethics Program. Uh, read this, but don't dwell on it. Uh, we'll revisit it uh, at the end of Unit 5. Note the chapter quotes, uh, especially the one from Peter Drucker. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, that is so true, uh, and that is so elegant. Uh, this is the business version of the famous Mike Tyson quote. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, when you're in the middle of a fight, culture is what keeps you going. It's your internalized muscle memory, uh, not remembering step three of your battle plan. Uh, uh, Drucker, uh, Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast, uh, he's probably the leading business author of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, his writings have influenced millions, uh, and his students have created and guided businesses worth billions, maybe trillions. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be someone's employer, then you have a moral obligation to make sure uh, people do look forward to coming to work in the morning. That's what uh, John uh, Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, says, and, and I, I think that's true also. Uh, when I think about uh, the people who work with me at my law firm, uh, I, you know, I do, <laughs> if they look like they're unhappy, to come to work in the morning, uh, I do try to change that. Um, if you're not having fun, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, uh, that's no kind of way to live in, in business. Maybe you should be doing something else. Uh, then there's Louis Gerstner's. Uh, he was the former chair of IBM. Uh, he said, I came to see in my time at IBM that culture isn't just one aspect of the game. It is the game. In the end, an organization is nothing more than the collective capacity of the people, its people, to create value. Uh, very, very true statement. So uh, creating an ethics program, that cold opening, you can read it. It'll give you a flavor for this very long chapter. Uh, I think the exercise they suggest would be more useful at the end of the chapter to discuss than at the beginning. It's too open-ended and too full of rabbit holes to go down. Uh, there's the uh, Warren Buffett uh, quote uh, about uh, uh, how, uh, well, I, I, I tell you, I think I might have something on this that's left over from, uh, uh, from Chapter 3. So uh, let's go on to... Uh, the chapter objectives for Unit 4. And the, uh, <clears throat> the first is to define uh, the corporate culture, uh, then to explain how corporate culture impacts ethical decision-making, uh, compliance-based culture versus value-based culture, uh, role of corporate leadership, uh, and then effective leaders versus ethical leaders. And that's, that's about all we'll get to uh, uh, today. Uh, we'll save the other four for next time. Uh, so uh, in this, in Unit 4, we'll do the first five objectives, and then in Unit 5, we'll do the remaining four of Chapter 4. Clear as mud? Okay. Uh, so let's uh, uh, dig into this very meaty chapter that's full of the tools and techniques of almost every good ethics program you will ever experience in any organization you may be part of uh, or hope to manage. What is corporate culture? It's a shared pattern of beliefs, expectations, and meanings that influences and guides the thinking and behavior of members of that organization. Uh, take a minute now and, and look at uh, figure one on page 94. Uh, that's a helpful reinforcement. Uh, also note the reality check on page 95. Uh, the common theme was that core value and a clear corporate purpose, which together are described as the organization's core ideology, were essential elements 
of these sustainable and financially successful companies. And then one more example, the uh, Trader Joe's example on pages 98 to 99. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been to a Trader Joe's, uh, but it's a, it's a great little grocery store. And it, it really feels different to shop there. It feels like, uh, uh, I don't know what the experience would be. It's sort of a, uh, um, I don't know, uh, the, the equivalent of, you know, Apple computer stores versus the other, you know, business equipment stores you go to, or perhaps uh, uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream versus other ice cream parlors. You just, you know that you're having a different experience when you're there shopping. Uh, based on the goods that they put on the shelf and, and the service that they supri uh, supply. Then uh, Trader Joe's has seven core values that create a family feeling among its employees and customers who have wow experiences while not taking itself too seriously. Uh, their motto is, it's just groceries. Uh, but uh, they do uh, uh, retain uh, their employees, including, you know, just their you know, they're low-level clerks and, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who stack the shelves, uh, stock the shelves, and that sort of thing. Those, those, uh, those people uh, tend to be retained for a very long period of time with that company uh, because of the family atmosphere. Uh, the diagram in figure 4.1 on page 94 looks a little like a, a Moibus trip, uh, a never-ending symbiotic relationship which the members shape the culture, and the culture shapes the members. Uh, that's an interesting, it's, it's one of those uh, weird uh, 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 figures uh, where you can circle around the entire strip and never move your finger, and you, you touch every surface uh, because of the way it's shaped. Uh, <clears throat> all of the successful habits uh, of visionary companies had one thing in common, whether their core value was a commitment to customers, employees, product innovation, or risk-taking, they had a well-defined corporate culture that reinforced that commitment. Note that in companies that fail, it's often the culture that sours first in the decline and fall, almost like you can smell, you know, when you've got bad cream in the refrigerator. Uh, how can you adapt to changing times and external influences? Uh, note the core value of Trader Joe's number five, Kaizen. It's an oriental concept and term that means in this context that each of us every day is trying to do a little better. Wouldn't that be a good value at Newbury College? We're trying to give all of you a great edu education, but what does that mean? It's a little like eating an elephant, isn't it? How do you do that? You do it one bite at a time. Uh, let me give you an example in my own life. I, I like to do my own landscaping at my house. Uh, and when we bought the house, the yard was a mess. It had been ignored uh, by the owners who were very busy uh, for probably four or five years. Uh, and so each weekend I try to improve one or more areas in the yard. And then once they are the way I like them, maintain them. After a few years, I think the cumul cumulative effect would be worth the sum of all these little projects to improve. And that's how a business can improve, too. If you can just improve a little bit, you know, just a, a few percent in what you do, and if you do it on a regular and continuous basis, uh, really a program of constant improvement, uh, you can see over a period of time tremendous results. And a lot of the great companies do that. Note all, almost all <coughs> large corporations have core values now. <coughs> and you see... Uh, the examples of some of them, uh, <laughs> some of which are really famous for their bad customer service. Uh, I'd question how well United Airlines or almost any passenger airline today lives up to the values that are shown in your book. Uh, maybe Lufthansa, maybe Air Emirates, uh, but probably not an American carrier. And definitely not American Airlines. Okay, let's move on to culture and ethics. Each of the factors in the Chapter 2 ethical decision-making model, which hopefully now after your exercise you're very familiar with, uh, can be supported or discouraged by the culture in which the decision is made. Are employees empowered to act ethically even when they're not legally required? 
Our employees expected to act ethically, even when there's a cost to doing so? Or, like the Wells Fargo example, are the employees blinded by a goal? Uh, it makes a very big difference in how, how things turn out. This is the discussion on pages 105 to 10, I'm sorry, page 101 to 105 of your textbook of the influence culture has for good or bad on the ethics uh, in an organization. Wells Fargo had avoided the NINA loans that caused so many banks like Wachovia to face failure in the collapse of the mortgage market in 2008. Wells Fargo was politically connected and was basically handed Wachovia Bank one of the largest banks based in the southeast for five cents on the dollar by the bank regulators and politicians after the crash. But they had other ethical challenges that caught up to them just a few years later because of their focus on cross-selling. Note how many good companies, including Samsung, Uber, Fox News, and others, have had serious ethical scandals in recent years. Uh, fortunately, Samsung makes commercial washers uh, not the Galaxy 7 phones in its Newberry plant. I'd, I'd hate for the uh, area to burn down. Uh, Compliance-based culture versus value-based culture. This is table 4.1. Uh, you can see uh, the aspects of compliance-based culture and the aspects of value-based culture are very different in their focus, uh, in, in how they're based, uh, in their objectives, uh, and uh, how they monitor and uh, uh, enforce uh, their culture. I would caution about the pejorative traditional <coughs> uh, uh, that's given to the compliance-based culture, and even more I'd caution about uh, uh, being influenced by the laudatory progressive uh, that's used in the book. Uh, these terms don't mean the same thing as we commonly understand them. Uh, today from politics or culture. The authors are using these terms, I believe, in both their traditional and correct dictionary meetings, not how we talk today. Note that P PI is an abbreviation for process improvement, uh, not that we're hiring detectives to check on ethical behavior, although I can think of some companies that would benefit uh, from that uh, practice. Also note the summaries of methodology uh, in your book on page 106. I didn't have room to include them on the slide, but the summaries are useful in explaining each approach to culture. And if you're having trouble, you know, absorbing that, uh, I think that discussion on page 106 is helpful. A compliance-based culture is one in which obedience to laws and regulations is the prevailing model and focuses on policies, transactions, and compliance. A value-based culture is one in which conformity to a statement of values and principles rather than simple obedience to the laws and regulations is the prevailing model for ethical behavior and the focus is on goals, strategies, and risk management processes. Ask yourself which culture is more likely to avoid crises in the future as the environment changes. I think the authors are spot on about this point although it doesn't mean that laws and regulations aren't important. They are just a foundation, but continual attention to ethical issues can help an organization uh, dodge that future bullet coming at them before it reaches them. Maybe those sorts of cultures can slow down the impact of time by paying attention to the future. Uh, maybe sort of like if you picture Neo doing that uh, dodging the bullets uh, in the matrix. Role of corporate leadership. <clears throat> We're moving on to objective four of the chapter, beginning on page 410. Uh, corporate leadership is really important. It's not merely leading by example, but although that sets the tone, it also demonstrates that commitment by allocating resources to ethical compliance and values. Uh, and we note that uh, beginning in the 1990s, uh, major corporations began to have ethics officers uh, to actually uh, institutionalize this practice. Uh, let's look at effective leaders versus ethical leaders. Um, and and they're both, both of these are important. Effective leaders are leaders who guide, direct, and escort others to a destination successfully and hopefully efficiently. Uh, 
ethical leaders are effective leaders who use ethically appropriate methods to motivate others and to achieve one's goals. And nowadays, you want to be both. Uh, note Greenleaf's servant leadership, leading by example instead of threats, coercion, intimidation, trickery, harassment, etc. And empowering subordinates, this is maybe one of the most powerful things you can do. It's like raising your children. Empowering your subordinates to take initiative and, you know, maybe even take some risks uh, in business, although don't take ethical risks, but take risk, you know, take some risk in business and solve problems for themselves. Uh, and that's how they can learn and grow. Uh, and that, that uh, uh, I think, can instill some ethical lessons and also teach your subordinates uh, to be effective leaders themselves. Well, that gets through our first five objectives. In our next discussion, uh, we'll get into the second half of Chapter 4. Uh, that'll be Unit 5, uh, coming in just a little while as, as we re-record our lectures and hopefully uh, get the sound fixed for you. Thank you so much, and have a great day.